So next talk is by Jules, Jules Jacobs. I don't know if it's uh, well pronounced. A simple concurrent lambda calculus for encoding session types. Yeah, so I have not slept the past three days due to jet lag, so I hope it will be coherent. But um, fortunately, we are going to do something very simple. We are going to take a session type lambda calculus and delete stuff from it. So we have already seen a bit of session type before. So uh, usually in languages with message passing, you have a stream of messages of the same type. But with session types, you basically have a kind of automaton that uh, tells you at which point in the protocol which messages you are allowed to send. And this basically comes in two flavors. Uh, we have the pi calculus, which we have seen in the previous talk. This is very elegant and minimal. And they have uh, some very beautiful minimal type systems. On the other hand, we have lambda calculus, in which we can add session types. We do that by adding channels and a new syntactic <laughs> category of session types. This is not really a minimal calculus. We can compile this away completely using a kind of CPS transformation. But in this talk, I want to do something else. I want to uh, keep the concurrent semantics, but um, make it very simple while still being able to encode all of session types. And this could potentially be used as a minimal basis for extensions like priorities or sharing, in which you need to think about fewer things. Okay, so let's first look at the standard session type lambda calculus, GV. It looks like this. We, have, uh, we can fork of a new thread, which also gets access to a channel C. And this fork returns the other endpoint C prime. We can receive and send. And we can write message passing programs like this. Mm. These channels have session types, which we have also seen in the previous talk. And the session types evolve as you execute your program. So in the functional style, we re each uh, channel operation returns a new channel with a type that is one step further in the protocol. So this is the one version of GV. We have uh, the standard lambda calculus types. We have a separate syntactic category of session types. We have a couple of session operations. And at the type level, we have this dual operation, which just exchanges sends and receives. OK, so let's look at what we can delete. First of all, we are going to delete the session types. We are going to delete the dual. And we are going to delete all these operations. <laughs> Uh, but of course, now this fork type signature uh, still has a session type, so we also want, need to change that a bit. So what we are going to do is to change the type signature of fork to this. So that's all. We are go just going to do linear lambda calculus with just this. So what's the intuition here? We usually pass fork a lambda, and then this x gets function type alpha to beta. We usually bind the result to some other function x prime, which gets type beta to alpha. And the idea is that when you call these functions simultaneously, then the arguments get, ex get, get exchanged and returned from the other call. And these things are linear, so they are single use. So let's look at a simple example. Here we fork off a thread. And in the, in the thread, we call the barrier, I call them x with a value 1. And we return. Uh, and in the main thread, we call it with unit. So what's going to happen is these values are simply going to be exchanged. So that's all this is. So you may ask, what can you really do with this? Um, but let, let's first look at how that works in the operational semantics so that you can see that it really has a concurrent semantics that's kind of like how real concurrency executes. So we have a configuration, uh, which is a finite map from natural numbers to threads which have an expression and a barrier marker. And these are the rules. So the first rule just says that if a thread can do a pure reduction, then that can happen. The second rule is rule for fork, which adds a thread to the configuration and a barrier. And the third rule is the most important rule. If two threads are simultaneously calling this barrier k, then this marker gets deleted and the values get ex exchanged. OK, let's look at another example. Here we first fork off the orange thread and then the blue thread. So initially, we just have the main thread in the configuration. And after the first step, we have forked off the orange thread, which is uh, connected to us via this barrier x and x prime. 
Then we are going to fork the blue thread, which is giving another connection. But you see that this X prime has been captured by the closure of the blue, blue thread, so that's now connected to T2. And after the first synchronization, uh, this value uh, three is exchanged. Uh, but we also exchange a continuation, which means that we could potentially continue communicating because now we are in a similar situation as in the second step. In this case, we just terminate, but we could keep communicating. So even though we are, can only use these barrier, barriers once, by using this trick by passing it to a new thread, we can keep communicating. So actually, we can encode all of the GV operations using this. And the encoding is actually pretty simple. So the fork is just a fork. The send spawns off such a messenger th thread. And the receive and close just call it with unit. And this means that if you take such a GV program and do this macro expansion, then uh, it will simulate the execution of the original program. The question is, of course, what about the types? Um, is this thing still well typed if you macro expand it? And the answer is, of course, yes. So we need to find some encoding of session types into lambda calculus types, which makes all these steps well typed. So that's also pretty simple. That looks like this. Um, basically, we, we exchange continuations. This is also similar to the work of the previous speaker in a, in a pi calculus. And uh, now, if we define these operations like this, then they have these types where we now encode all the session types. And then we can, pr uh, we can prove in Coq that if the GV program is well typed and the macro expanded program, program is well typed, and the semantics of the macro expanded program simulates the original semantics. So what about deadlocks? One of the important properties of GV is that it's deadlock free. Well, it turns out that in this setting, it's actually a little bit simpler to see why this is deadlock free. First of all, the simple deadlocks are ruled out because uh, if one of the threads doesn't use its barrier at all, that is ruled out by linearity. That would uh, create a deadlock, but that's ruled out by linearity. The more interesting case is if we have a cycle like this. This is not directly ruled out by typing of the configurations, but it turns out that if you start with a well-typed program, then such cycles can never happen. Let's see why. So if you do a fork, and we initially had some thread that is connected to three barriers, uh, it is possible that the lambda of the fork captures some of these barriers, which then get connected to the new thread. But as you see, if the original configuration was acyclic, then the new one is, is two. Similarly for the sync operation, there we use the barrier between T1 and T2 to exchange values, which maybe may contain some barriers. But here too, if the original configuration was acyclic, then a new one is. So I have mechanized this in, in Cox. So one of the basic, so this language with recursive session types and uh, with recursive types and nonlinear types. One of the basic theorems that you want is global progress, which just says that if you start with a program, then it can keep stepping until the configuration is empty. I've also me mechanized the partial deadlock freedom theorem, which says that not even a subset of the con configuration can get stuck. And a memory leak freedom theorem, which in this case simply says that these barrier markers are cleaned up. And because this language is simpler, this is about half the size of an earlier GV mechanization. In addition to this, we also have this compiler from GV to this language, the proof that the programs that you get are well typed and that the semantics simulates the original semantics. So what have we seen? We can delete almost everything from a session type language. You can just do this. Um, and then we can still simulate all the things that we want. That's it. No, I'm not going to ask the same question. Um, 
Did I get this right? Um, are you modeling a version of GV where you, where end is self-dual? Yes. Okay. Have you thought about how it would work out if you had two different ends? Uh, yes, I think you can do that. So in this encoding here, uh, you encode end as unit to unit. But I think there's also different encoding where you don't do the last synchronization, but where you can just throw away your end. I think then it would be like that. You would need two different ends. Right. So the reason I'm asking is because I think you'll, you may end up with a, a nicer correspondence with, with logic if you do it that way. And I'm kind of interested in what, logically speaking, this fork operator corresponds to anyway. <laughs> right. So Is it some sort of uh, control operator, obviously? Yes. So I, I think it's not exactly the same as the standard ones, but um, someone pointed me to something called Goethe logic, and they think that it's somewhat similar to this, but uh, I'm not completely sure because, so in Goethe log logic, you have the axiom that you have alpha to beta or beta to alpha. So this is a kind of weaker version of the law of excluded middle. I think it's not exactly the same as this, but maybe related. Thanks. Anyway, really cool work. <coughs> Other comments or questions? Um, have you considered splitting fork into new and spawn and what all of this would look like? So I think you can uh, have a new here, which just creates you a pair of alpha to beta and beta to alpha. Of course, then you get that lock, so you would need something like pr priorities to get that lock freedom again. Uh, I've not looked into that yet, but it, I think it's worth trying. Okay, cool. Maybe we have time for a last quick question. Just to follow up on Sam's question, so if you want a logical interpretation, what would the one turn into? Because the one is uh, uninteresting logically, right? Yes, indeed. I, I think uh, you would need to change it a bit to to get a logical interpretation. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't really know at this point. Okay, <laughs> okay let's thank the speaker again.